Good morning, Queensway. It is such an honor, and I really truly thank you for this honor of being able to um, sit with God's word and then meditate on it throughout the week and allow him to, to speak to me and have him change my heart. And I pray that these words would echo and resound in your hearts today as well as he's been preparing me. Over the last three weeks, we have been sitting in this series called We're Expecting. And we've, we've dove deep into the genealogy in Matthew 1 and, and really probably walked away with a few more questions than answers, right? Who are these women really? Like, there's very little really written about them, about how they felt in those situations that they found themselves in by circumstances or, or the way that they've been treated. There's, there's very little there. Yet their stories are so important to be spoken of. As they resonate and they lead us up to a beautiful mother who then bears in this whole storyline, right? We read of Mary who comes, who makes herself willing before God and says, here I am, a willing servant before you. Have your way, with, have, have your way in my life and may it be glorifying to you. And I think these stories probably, and I think have, resonated in each one of our hearts At some point, maybe it's been the story of Tamar, maybe it's been the story of Rahab or Ruth, maybe today it'll be the story of Bathsheba, who in Matthew 1 is referred to as Uriah's wife. Her name is not even mentioned explicitly in the text, and yet Uriah is her husband, who was, well, we'll get into the story. I don't want to give too much away. Spoilers alert right there. But each one of these women go on to have a baby in the family tree of Jesus, right? And from this stump of Jesse comes this beautiful oak tree as it's written in Isaiah, where Jesus, our Emmanuel, babe king, God with us, comes to us through a willing teenage mother, Mary. The world has yearned for this king, at just the right time. It's been long awaited. We've been expecting, anticipating, earnestly desiring God, the word of God, and took on flesh and pitched his tent and lived among his people whose stories are not much different than our own, are they? Very complicated stories. And this Jesus, friend of sinners, meets a people who are needy, dysfunctional, distracted, and ultimately self-destructive and enters into that world and into each one of our stories. God specializes in dealing with messy people. I'm almost hitting the end of my sermon before I get there, so it's all right, though. It's okay. But God is, God is, specializes in dealing with messy people and messy stories, messy families, and he presents a beautiful salvation plan a world-changing storyline in this narrative. These smaller stories point us to a story maker, the grand script writer, you could say, although all these people had choices still, very much had choices. But he's weaving the story bigger than the tiniest little baby storyline. It's about each person mentioned in the line of Matthew 1 that leads us up to this narrative of this baby being born in Bethlehem, kind of a full circle isn't it, to the town of David in Bethlehem. Bethlehem. It's about the God of small things and how those small things, when woven together, create a tapestry of people's stories, God's own big design, making his purpose, having his glory be told now and forevermore. And God's plans are bigger than these stories, bigger than you and I, and we stand with awe in awe, that we are not forgotten, that we are not unloved, that we are very much the reason that the story was created. Salvation for all, once and for all, to be with the one who loves us, who loved the world, that he gave his one and only son. Emmanuel, God with us. And I wanted to start with that today. And I'll end with it again, because it truly is. 
truly is the purpose for preaching entirely. Jesus, the one and only. One of those stories, as we're going to dive into it, is the story of Bathsheba. Bathsheba is otherwise known, as I mentioned, Uriah's wife in Matthew 1. She's one of the last women before we get to Mary, which is why I also wanted to tell Mary's story. Not that you didn't know it already. You probably have read it already before. But Mary's pretty important too. But we're going to focus in on Bathsheba's story. In 2 Samuel chapter 11 and 12, you'll find it in your Bibles, in the Old Testament. And I have to say, it comes with some heavy adult content. We've been giving this discre- adult discretion is advised uh, within our sermons. But this is God's word. And every time we open up God's word, we rely heavily on his Holy Spirit to lead us and to guide us to his truth, a timeless truth. For us to live by as his disciples right now. The challenge for each one of us. So let's pray. God, as we faithfully open your word, longing to hear from you, would you guide us and speak to us again today? Your word, your truth is what we long for. We want to live by it. Have it resonate in our hearts. Change us by your Holy Spirit. Move us to repentance. Allow us to experience the forgiveness of sins if we have not yet, or again, yet again. And turn us towards devoted discipleship in our daily life. To love like you love us. And in all we do and say, do for your glory and in your name, Jesus. Our Emmanuel, God with us, our King of Kings and our Prince of Peace. Amen. So turn with me, 2 Samuel chapter 11. And I'm going to take it in chunks this time around, and I'm going to break it down for us. Just in case if we have questions, or we might even walk away with more questions, and that's all right. In the spring of the year, the time when the kings go out to battle, David sent Joab and his servants with him and all Israel, and they ravaged the Ammonites and besieged Rabbah. But David remained in Jerusalem. Now there's a lot of, I'm going to say, geographical, political stuff that's happening, historical wars that are happening here throughout the storyline, but that's not my focus today. I want to try to stick to Bathsheba, so my emphasis will be more the characters in the story today. We have a king who's at war with the Ammonites, but a king who stayed behind He sent his best men out. This is like, I don't know, who are the the best men out there? What would be the titles? I can think of the Russians, but I can't think of the... Anyways, you know what I mean. The best men are going before. They're going off to war. But the king, the leader of the army, the commander-in-chief, what is he doing? He's staying behind. He's missing in action. He stays back at a time when he could have stepped up and led. Verse 2, and then this happens. It happened late one afternoon when David arose from his couch and was walking on the roof of the king's house that he saw from the roof a woman bathing, and the woman was very beautiful. And David sent and inquired about the woman, and one said, Is it not Bathsheba, the daughter of Eliam, the wife of Uriah the Hittite? So David sent the messengers and took her, And she came to him, and he lay with her. Now she had been purifying herself from her uncleanliness. Then she returned to her house. And the woman conceived, and she sent and told David, I am pregnant. This is our initial encounter, our first encounter with Bathsheba, who's often referred to probably more often as the woman in the text than she is actually by her name, right? And she's known as Uriah's wife or Eliam's daughter. She's prominent. She's got a prominent role. And King David sees her bathing. King David sees her from his rooftop, performing her monthly ritual bathe. She's following the legal legal Levitical law that's been put out there that women need to be doing this after they've had their period, after their monthly. And she was following the law. And King David inquires about her as he sees her there. And we're given her name Bathsheba, and she is the daughter of this prominent man, Eliam, and the wife of a prominent man, Uriah. 
who's not an Israelite, but a Hittite at that, but off at war, fighting for King David, which we'll get to there. The messengers came in and brought her to him, and he lay with her. The language will change towards the end of the text, and I want you to take note of that. She conceived and reported the news back to King David that she was pregnant with child. We need to unpack this encounter a little bit, because so often in the commentaries of old, <laughs> there's a word that's used to describe this, and it would be adultery, right? And suggesting that perhaps it was consensual, perhaps even hints at her willingness to go. I, I, I really kind of have a hard time with that. And I really struggled with that, of how I would explain that carefully in this text. But I think what gave it away for me, the change, was actually the end of the text when he, you'll find out, he takes her as his wife, and there's more of a tenderness and an intimacy and an actual relationship that's forming. This is not that, right? There's no relationship here. There's a I see, I want, I have, I get. Clearly a, 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 a king in a prominent role taking advantage of his subject. There is a power imbalance. We've been using that. There's a, a misuse and abuse of power occurring here. And I think contextually and biblically we are presented with the scenario that, that a king, even a king after God's own heart, used his position inappropriately and abused one of his subjects taking advantage of her in this scenario. He is, she is not his and he claims her as his own. Gross abuse of power, role, position. And even though she was a prominent woman, she wasn't it wasn't like, well, Tamar, where Judah sees and thinks that she's a prostitute. This is a prominent woman. She's got a position in society. And he sees and he takes and he wants. And she becomes a, a victim, in a sense, to his abuse of power, dominance, and importance over her. And it isn't without consequence. She becomes pregnant. Let's continue reading God's word. So David sent word to Joab, send me Uriah the Hittite. And Joab, this is a commander-in-chief kind of that's already gone off ahead, the general, you could say, sent Uriah to David. And Uriah came to him. David asked how Joab was doing and how the people were doing and how the war was going. Let's, let's talk a little bit about things that aren't really important. Really, <laughs> they are important. But <laughs> in the grand scheme of things, David has him here for a certain purpose. And David said to Uriah, go down to your house and wash your feet. And Uriah went out of the king's house and there followed him a present from the king. So the king is flattering him with a gift. Here's a, here's a present. And, and, but Uriah slept at the door of the king's house with all the servants of his lord and did not go down to his house. So David's saying, go home. Go be with your wife. Take a break from the war. Have a bit of an escape. Go. Go be with her. And Uriah is refusing to go down to his wife. When they, were told, they, were, they told David, Uriah did not go down to his house. David said to Uriah, have, have you not come from a journey? Why have you not gone down to your house? And Uriah said to David, the ark and, the, and Israel and Judah dwell in booths, and my lord Joab and the servants of my lord are camping in the open fields. Shall I then go to my house to eat and to drink and to lie with my wife? As you live and as your soul lives, I will not do a thing. He's refusing to go back to his wife to eat and to drink and to have festivities while his soldiers are at war, his fellow soldiers are at war. So Uriah remained in Jerusalem that day and the next, and David invited him, and he ate in his presence and drank. Well, David's trying to get him drunk a little, right? Like giving him presents, flattering him, getting him drunk. And in the evening, he went out to lie on his couch with the servants of the Lord, but he did not go down to his house. So this chunk could be really entitled as David's plans unravel, right? Best land plans. He's, he's trying to think, well, if Uriah goes back to his house, it, this child that Bathsheba is carrying could be and might be considered Uriah's. That's the grand scheme here that David has figured out. Now, after finding out that Bathsheba was pregnant, David quickly ushers her husband home and tells him to go home to his wife. Getting him, giving him presents and getting him drunk, and his plan was hopefully that they would sleep together and the child could be passed off as Uriah's. 
to no avail. Uriah refuses to go back to Bathsheba. As a disciplined soldier, he does not participate in this opportunity before him. What we see here is that Uriah is a disciplined soldier in so much as he upholds this case. Something that maybe King David didn't do. Already we're seeing a character difference. Not only did David not go down to the war with his soldiers, he stayed back and slept with one of their wives. So now it's going to be hard to pass the child off as Uriah's. Let's read on. In the morning, David wrote a letter to Joab and sent it by hand of Uriah. And in the letter he wrote, set Uriah in the forefront of the hardest fighting battle and then draw back from, draw back from him that he may be struck down and die. And as Joab was besieging the city, he assigned Uriah to the place where he knew there were valiant men. And the men of the city came out and fought with Joab, and some of the servants of David among the people fell. Uriah the Hittite also died. Then Joab sent and told David all the news about fighting, and he instructed the messenger, When have you finished telling all the news about the fighting to the king? Then if the king's anger arises, rises, and he says to you, Why did you go so near the city to fight? Did you not know that they would shoot from the wall? Who killed Abimelech, the son of Jerusalem? Jer- I knew I was going to have to stop there. Jerubbeth did not a woman cast an upper millstone on him from the wall so that he died of Thebes. Thebes. Why did you go so near to the wall? And then you would say, your servant Uriah the Hittite has also died. So there's a lot there. The main point is that King David says, sends Uriah with a letter to the general to tell him to go to the front lines. And Uriah the Hittite died. Bathsheba's husband dies. So the messenger went and came and told David all that Joab had sent to him. I think we're on the right there. The messenger said to David, The men gained an advantage over us and came out against us in the field, but we drove them back to the entrance of the gate. Then the archer shot at your servants from the walls, and some of the servants, king's servants are dead, and your servant the Uriah the Hittite is dead also. David said to the messengers, Thus you shall say to Joab, Do not let this matter displease you, for the sword devours now one and then another. Strengthen your attack against the city and overthrow it, and encourage him. Best laid plan, right? Here's King David going, Well, if I can't pass the child off as Uriah, I'm going to have to get rid of Uriah. Urgently, King David is urgently thinking about, How do I cover up my mess here? And he sends Uriah to the front lines. Verse 26. When the wife of Uriah heard, when the wife of Uriah, I don't even have her name here. When the wife of Uriah heard that Uriah, her husband, was dead, she lamented over her husband. And when the morning was over, David sent and brought her to his house, and she became his wife and bore a son. But the thing that David had done displeased the Lord. These two verses tell us so much. It tells us that the wife of Uriah, Bathsheba, was devastated over the death of her husband. She takes the mourning time. After all, she was his wife. She carries the grief of this loss heavy in her heart. David doesn't leave her abandoned, sure. He takes her in as one of his wives, but she bears him a son. But right at the end, we have this commentary, this narrative, this kind of comment about how we then know how the Lord feels about this. What David had done, the thing that David had done, had displeased the Lord. What he did wasn't right. And didn't honor the Lord's commands. And it leads us into 2 Samuel chapter 12. And normally I wouldn't take such a big chunk of scripture like this in a sermon. But I feel like if we don't cover chapter 12, then it doesn't really, it's a story. But it's, this is where the commentary and the change of heart and, um, well, the rest of the story continues on in chapter 12. It tells us that there's more. There was a prophet named Nathan. 
And Nathan comes to King David and tells him this parable of a man with many lambs. And then there was a poor man with one lamb. And when a visitor comes, the rich man with the rich man with many lambs doesn't look at his own flock and offer it up as a as a, as a lamb to be roasted for the feast of this for, to celebrate this visitor. No, he turns to the poor man and he takes his one lonely lamb and he creates a feast from that poor man's lamb. Well, David is outraged. Such an injustice. Wouldn't you think? Ah, David, what you have done here is like that injustice, that injustice of seeing somebody else's wife and taking her for yourself, that injustice. <sighs> Nathan shines a light on, on his behavior, on his own sinfulness, with Uriah and Bathsheba. And Nathan tells him what will happen next is that the child will die. Bathsheba's son will die from this. And the child does. No doubt leaving Bathsheba with double the loss. Can you imagine the grief on her heart? David is repentant. And he does have a change of heart. And as we read, we can read about his change of heart in Psalm 51. When he's calling out to God in verse 1 of Psalm 51, hear this. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your unfailing love, according to your great compassion. Blot out my transgressions. Wash away all my iniquities and cleanse me from my sin. And he goes on in verse 17 of chapter 51 of Psalm 51. My sacrifice, O God, is a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart. O God, you will not despise. And then we read at the end of chapter 12. David comforted his wife. Note the change of language here. He comforted his wife Bathsheba, went to her, and made love to her. There's a change of language there, even in the Hebrew. And she gave birth to a son, and they named him Solomon. The Lord loved him because the Lord loved him. He sent word to Nathan, the prophet, to name him Jedidiah. And Jedidiah, Solomon's other name, means loved by God. I mean, I've heard a story of scheming, deception, and lies, of, of taking advantage of people, of injustices, of murder, right? There's so much in this story. But the story right at the end tells us that there is this child who is loved by God. And what a way to end this messy, chaotic, scheming, self-destructive story that it is. There is this line of redemption. Solomon's name, Jedediah, means loved by God. Now, this doesn't keep the family line, you know, innocent as anything and honest and pursuing a, you know, deep and abiding and um, honoring relationship with God. Sometimes they do, sometimes they don't. They waver, they wander, they have sinned, they kill their brother after trying to get the throne. It, it gets, it's, it's messy still. But you gotta, we got to dial in on this one phrase where redemption is presented here in this story, where forgiveness is here, where there is a truth that is timeless, that is right here in the name of this son that didn't, well, that kind of wraps it all up. Throughout this story and the stories of our lives, there is this truth that resounds louder than any lie, any deception, anywhere we've been. Any self-destructive path that we may have walked on, there is a God who loves you, and your name might not be Jedediah, but I'm speaking that truth to you today. 
that you are loved by God. There is a God who loves you. There is a God who loves you no matter what your history. If you've been the victim, my tender heart goes out to you. If you've ever felt like the victim, my heart goes out to you. If ever you've been the abuser, my heart goes out to you. And if ever you've been a simple observer to all things, there is a God who sees us, who is with us, who loves us, who knows our motives, our fears, our failures, our selfish ambition, our lustful habits, our skeletons in the closet. He is a God who knows our generational sins, the trails of displeasing behavior toward him, and yet the most powerful truth of all time, throughout all time, is found in the Gospel of John chapter 3, verse 16, and I believe you already know this, and if you don't hear this truth, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son that whoever believes in him will not die, but have eternal life. God loves each one of us all of humanity, so much that he provided for us a way out of our self-destructive plan. This is the grandest story of all. This is what we call the gracious salvation plan for us. He didn't just say he loved us. He provided a way for us to come out of our self-destructive ways and come to him. He doesn't expect us to pull up our own bootstraps and try to make things right. He says, come to me humbly seeking me, really, as, as David did, and seek out the forgiveness that he offers us today. He loved us so much that he showed us grace in our sinful state and saved us from that. This is the story of Christmas. By sending us his son, Jesus Christ, Emmanuel, babe, king, our Emmanuel, our God is with us. He took it upon himself to be with us, to become one of us, to take on flesh like us, to take the scorn of our sin and the trails of our stories. He came, and it starts in the manger, that babe born in Bethlehem, the town of David. And it goes all the way to the cross, to Jerusalem, where he puts out his arms and he says, Oh, Lord, I give my all to you. And it proves victorious in this empty tomb, which says that death has not gotten the best of us. No, we have a risen Savior, King, Messiah, Emmanuel, God with us still and forevermore redeeming us, a people so unworthy, and making a way of life eternal for us. God moved by love, redeems a people so unworthy by sending us a son who is the only worthy one to take on our sins completely. And Jesus, fully God, fully man, was the only way to make things right. In this deep, abiding, loving relationship with God of the universe. So whatever your story is, wherever you've come from, I've had a rough week. <laughs> it's been a week for the records. <laughs> but no matter, no matter, no matter, and including all of it, too. Because I think, I think God... God wants to be with us in those weeks, in those stories. And that is exactly what the gospel, what Emmanuel God with us is, is it is Emmanuel God with us in the midst of this. So no matter what you are, no matter what you've done, no matter where you've been, God's story of loving redemption is the hope, the very hope you need this season. This is the story I need this season. 
It is the gospel truth I need to hear and to live by yet again. It's a story about how the God of the universe and all of his glory and all of his perfection and all of his great love enters into our frailty, into our broken world, into our wretched states and meets us with overflowing grace. That by believing in him, we have access to the most beautiful Messiah friend and the God of the universe and the comforter for us who reaches out to say, I have you still, you are mine, and I love you. Today we're expecting, we're expecting God to move through our stories, bringing us to even a deeper relationship with him over this season. We're expecting God to keep his promises to come again and make all things right. A shalom on earth as it is in heaven. We're longing to bring his hope again to despair of despair for our world, to the victims and the abusers and the observers alike. We're desiring his resounding joy in the sorrows of our life, meeting us in our grief or our loss or our pain. We anticipate the many ways his love will reach every heart, every trembling heart, and our own yet again. As we contemplate at the marvel and marvel at the tender, humble birth of our Savior, Jesus Christ, born to the teenage virgin mother and his father, Joseph, who takes him on as a child. And we very willingly say, God, write your story through us. We can expect that when we believe by faith that Jesus is the one true way to the Father and surrender our lives, our stories, to this God of love, that God will write the rest of the story. And you can expect your story to be a story of redemption, of eternal glory, of everlasting life. To be a story that even when everything feels like it's falling apart, when the dirt hits the fan, when grief and loss and hurt and pain seem to prevail, this is not the end of your story. We can expect a God who is with us in the midst of that, in all seasons of our lives. We can expect a God to love us even still. We can expect our God to save us. So what is your story what are you expecting from God this season? We can't expect much at the manger when we come with humble hearts. We can expect the promise that he is always with us. We can expect the forgiveness of, of sins when we come longing for him to deal with us. We can expect a love that will never let us go. We can expect a God who will come again. We can expect to be filled with his love. Anselm of Canterbury writes this. Maybe this is your prayer with me today. Let me be filled with your love, rich in your affection, completely held in your care. Take me and possess me wholly, who with the Father and the Spirit are alone blessed from age to age. Or perhaps you feel more like George Matheson. O oh, love that will not let me go, I rest my weary soul in thee. I give thee back the life I owe, that in thine ocean steps its flow may richer, fuller be. O oh, light that followest all my days, I yield my flickering torch to thee. My heart restores its borrowed rays, that in thy sunshine's blaze its days may brighter, fairer be. O oh, joy that seekest me through pain, I cannot close my heart to thee. I trace the rainbow through the rain and feel the promise is not in vain that morn shall tearless be. 
O cross that lifts this up my head, I dare not ask to fly from thee. I lay dust life's glory dead, and from the ground there blossoms red life that shall endless be. Amen. Let's pray. And Lord, you know our hearts. You know our stories. You have a love that will not let us go. A love that pursues us, holds on to us. That no matter where we've been or what we've done, or, oh, we rest our weary hearts in thee. You know our grief, our loss, our pain. We rest our weary hearts in thee. And Lord, we come, even with calling out as David did, seeking your forgiveness for the sins that you know of through and through. And the wayward heart that we have had We rest our weary hearts in thee and we seek you. We seek your mercy, your grace yet again. Lord, we thank you for your truth today. That you love us and you will never let us go. That you are with us forevermore. In Jesus' name.